Hi, I'm Matthew from Patchworks, and today I'm here with Ryan from Acid Rain Technology. Hello. Ryan brought in the Maestro, which has been a huge hit. Um, I see them in cases everywhere. I personally own one. Uh, I love it. It's replaced so many of my LFOs and um, even just uh, envelope generator, actually. I've been using it for that quite a bit. Can you tell us what the Maestro is? Yeah. So the Maestro is a six-channel, we call it a clocked modulation controller. So uh, in Eurorack modular, you have audio sources like oscillators. You have audio processors like filters and effects, uh, delays, reverbs, uh, all kinds of crazy stuff. And then um, control voltage generators. Those are okay. kind of the three main food groups of Eurorack. And Maestro is a part of the third there where it creates um, low frequency voltages. Uh, it's called DC voltage. Um, that, mean, that just means voltage moving very, very slowly. Okay. Um, and audio is voltage moving very, 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 very fast. Right. Um, uh, and the um, Maestro has six different channels that can create complex, slow moving voltages that change over time that you patch into the control voltage inputs of your other modules in your system to give you uh, six arms, <laughs> six extra <laughs> arms or six extra pairs of, uh, fingers and thumbs yeah. to move parameters around while you perform. Um, and then it's also able to save and load whole module states. So you can use feature. Maestro as a way to, um, the way we look at it is like advance a patch performance over time and create um, kind of by changing what all six channels are doing and respectively how they're manipulating other yeah. uh, control voltage in inputs in your system, um, Maestro is able to kind of create um, more sonic interest that changes uh, over time throughout your patch so that your uh, listener if you're so playing cool. live or if, even if you're just playing for yourself in the studio, things don't get boring. Right. Your rack uh, can have, I think this is something a lot of people will relate to who use this stuff. It can have a tendency to play like little eight beat loops right. again and again and yeah. again. Um, Cause a lot of the equipment in your rack is kind of, um, I guess you could say that's, that's maybe the lowest hanging fruit <laughs> yeah, of, yeah. of how to, how it can be. Used. I agree. So with the maestro, one of our big goals was to find, uh, explore at least one way to break out of that quick, yeah. that short loop kind of, um, swamp that yeah, <laughs> people can get, people swamp. can get, uh, I like that. can get, can get stuck in. And <laughs> I have absolutely gotten stuck in many, many times. So, um, hopefully the little demo I'll show later can, uh, demonstrate how Maestro can be used to kind of push things around and, yeah. and keep things relatively interesting over time. What's really cool um, about that is being able to load those different states yeah. is something that you can do. You can kind of just like on the fly, you're performing with the Maestro, or this is what I've done when I'm playing, is you create these versions of your patch, right? right? And then you can just grab switch over to that one, switch over to the new one. Like it's seamless. It loads immediately. Yeah. And then also having those mute channels on top of that. And then being able to change your modulation rate of your LFOs on the fly. And then you can revert back to your original patch. Yeah, exactly. That's, and it's intuitive like it is on a groove box. Totally. You know, Eurorack is like, you feel like you're in this like really crazy headspace when you're doing it and things are static, which is what I think of when we think of a patch kind of staying mm -hmm. in that eight, you know, you called that swamp. Yeah. That swamp is like this static fixed state where I'm kind of stuck in this looping sure. cycle and that it really does help you break out of that. I mean, yeah. modulation is definitely going to, what's going to break you out into uh, new sonic territory in exactly. your rack. So it's, it's important in a powerful feature. Yeah, modulation and you know control voltage is one of the things, if not the main thing, that makes Eurorack unique and, and kind of a unusual tool. I know there's you know other 
tools for making music have their own forms of uh, parameter modulation, like automation lanes, like we mentioned, and right. uh, digital audio workstations. But um, with control voltage, there's so many ways to use it in kind of an unpredictable or semi-predictable manner where right. you're just, you know, trying things out and, and you know, oh, what would this kind of chain sound like? Right. And then you just yeah. immediately punch, punch it in and it's it's that kind of experimentation is right there in front of you. Um, yeah. And what you mentioned earlier with being able to change a bunch of parameters and then snap back to a save slot. Um, that's something I use all the time with the maestro. And I think about it as like, um, in a live performance context, you're walking further and further out on a limb of a you're tree right. yeah. and getting more precarious, maybe trying some things where when you hit that parameter setting you don't quite know right. what it's going to sound like and if it really screws it up yeah, <laughs> and yeah, you're yeah. really you know throws your patch off you can really quickly hit load and then go back to something yeah. where that you've maybe pre-programmed at home or in a you know more uh, preparatory state of totally using your machine. it's kind of similar to um to why people enjoy being a DJ or doing DJ yeah. stuff is that you can, you can kind of remix things. Mm -hmm. You can take some chances yeah. during a live performance yeah. and you always have a safety net. Yeah. Yeah. But you need both. You need the, right. the need safety the... net, but you need the risk taking as yeah, well. Exactly. That's what makes a really good DJ set. Um, I've also been using it as an envelope generator recently. It's uh, really fun to trigger a chain of down ramp envelopes at different timings. So you get, that's almost like a decay length modulated envelope. Oh, um, so you go, ba, 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 oh ba, that's a great that idea. Stuff. Yeah. Oh, really cool. Um, especially if it has a uh, chain length of uh, like a kind of a non-standard number of waveforms, like five or seven, then they're not going to repeat perfectly over a four, four, you know, speaking piece. of non-standard waveforms, yeah. like one of the coolest things about the maestro is that function where you can kind of just inject different waveforms in your oscillations of your LFO, I guess would be a way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Building chains. Yeah. Building chains, Yeah, which is really intuitive. And easy. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have those strange looking waveforms on there called high and low. You'd think, well, what the heck is that useful yeah, for? Yeah. Um, you know, on or off. But, you know, you think about the up ramp and the down ramp and the high and low like uh, building blocks. So okay. you go up and then you stay high and then you go down, stay low. Oh. So you can almost think about it like drawing a line across time. Like if any of you have ever worked with a digital audio workstation with automation lanes, you see the same kind of yeah. lines in there controlling parameters. How many, um, like say I go a ramp up and then I stay on high, mm -hmm. how long can I do, how many highs can I do per se? Well, uh, if you aren't using the trigger input of the channel that you're putting this chain on in the mic, in the uh, maestro, then you can do 32 waveforms currently. Okay. Uh, cool. So that's all waveforms in a chain. And, um, but if you do use the trigger input, um, so you're every time a rising edge of a trigger comes in, it triggers the next waveform in the right. chain. It's kind of steps through them. So you could you be using an external gate sequencer or trigger sequencer or a um, another channel of the maestro. And I'll actually be doing a little bit of that. Oh, cool. Here, lots cool. of self-patching opportunities with the maestro. So if you're uh, using the trigger input of the maestro, then the waveform that you trigger in a chain holds at the final value of the waveform. So say you trigger an up ramp, it's going to go up and it's going to stay high until the next trigger comes in and oh. then do whatever the next one is, whether that be low, right. down ramp, up, down. Um, so you could trigger, you know, a low and then it'll go or an up ramp. It'll go up and then you can, you know, have it stay, open up a filter right. and then wait to trigger a, you know, really fast little up down, which will create a little, you know, 
Super cool. Block of some That's kind. you know, yeah. I hadn't thought of that when you said like using it as building blocks. Yeah. I yeah. didn't think of that like, oh yeah, it's like automation lanes and like Ableton or Bitwig, and I can just make a ramp, hold the ramp. To me, I was kind of like, this is cool. Um, just random LFO elements that I can put. And I love that you added that attenuation feature. Oh yeah. That has been fantastic. Um, much requested, much yeah, requested. We listen <laughs> by, by me. I'm one of the requesters. We were talking about what makes Eurorack unique. Yeah. One of the things that I think about often when I think of Eurorack manufacturer is where did they come from? Were they originally pedal manufacturers? Is that somewhere that it started? Is that the case for you? It's actually not. Um, I, d I personally do have a background in guitar. I mm -hmm. think uh, a lot of people I've met in Eurorack um, yeah, who are well. roughly our age <laughs> <laughs> played in you know guitar bands in high Absolutely, school 100%. and in middle school and whatnot. <laughs> learned uh, learned guitar as a as their main instrument um, earlier on, but. Um, and a lot of Eurorack manufacturers, particularly the ones that have been around for like 10 plus years that I've met did come from pedals. Right. Um, cause there was kind of a pedal bonanza there was in yeah. music technology from what I gather. I obviously wasn't professionally involved in it at the time, but, um, yeah, from what I understand that was kind of a, it's a very similar world mm -hmm. to what we're doing here. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Some of the circuits are, you know, identical. They can go both right, ways. Right. And you see that with some of the companies like Strymon making, uh, you know, the Magneto. porting some of the, uh, digital signal processing between their pedals and their right. Euro rack offerings. Um, have but, you ever thought about making a guitar pedal? Yeah. You know, I have thought about it because, you know, I do play guitar, mm -hmm. so I'd be able to kind of evaluate it and I think it'd be really cool. It. Yeah. Haven't, haven't thought of anything perfect yet. So, um, but it's not off the table and if anyone has suggestions, our, uh, <laughs> <laughs> our inboxes are always open. Uh, we love talking to you guys. I love that. But yeah. How we got started. Um, you know, I, like I said, I played in guitar bands in high school pretty seriously. Um, but also was into like recording equipment, Okay. pretty seriously in high school and even middle school. I think uh, I was very lucky to get into home recording right when it got good and affordable. Oh, yeah. You know, in the early 2000s or so where, yeah. you know, you could record something that sounded pretty decent. decent. Yeah, yeah, You yeah. know, for with a few hundred dollars worth of equipment instead of a few thousand dollars worth of equipment. Totally. Um, there was a big sea change there. Um, so I got really into that and I, I see pro audio equipment as to being maybe even a little closer to Euro rack in the nerdiness and the, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the, uh, kind of complexity yeah. of, of kind of learning. It seems how... to be the same kind of people. Yeah. Are yeah. Like, you, or it, moderately the same group of people are interested in pro audio are also interested in modular. It's like, yeah, I don't know if it's because of uh, the age or yeah. something that this came about and I'm not sure, but, um, well, in working with, uh, digital audio workstations at this time as well, you started to see affordable like VST synths and right. All, you know, sample playback and, and samplers in, in the computer right. where you could like Eurorack make a whole track at home yeah. all by yourself as yeah. like a, a home producer. And of course people have been doing that, you know, for decades and decades, right. but, uh, it was much, much harder on tape. It was much, <laughs> yeah, way, way, yeah. way harder on tape. So anyhow, got into that tech right when you, you know, became kind of a user friendly software. And, uh, I went to, college for industrial design, which oh, is cool. like designing and being involved with the manufacturing of physical products, um, which has helped a lot in <laughs> yeah. making acid rain surprise, technology. Surprise, surprise, right? Exactly. <laughs> really cool. Um, so that's kind of my background in, in like user interfaces, uh, industrial design, manufacturing. And after college, got uh, into electronic music. Cause uh, I think in the U S at least electronic music was really coming into the public consciousness quite a bit around right. 20, 2009, 2010. Um, 
and discovered, you know, synthesizers. Yeah. And <laughs> the rest is history, yeah. as they say. <laughs> Got into Eurac as a hobby and then met my uh, co-founder, Michael, on a bus. Which is Seattle. just a crazy coincidence. Insane. Super serendipity. Yeah. Totally. And yeah, we started hanging out and designing these things. And a couple of years later, thanks to all of the amazing support <laughs> from all of you out there who've decided to bring these modules into your systems, we... We do this full time and, um, yeah, just feel incredibly lucky to be able to design creative tools that yeah. other people get to use, uh, we're to like make music. everyone I talk to that has gotten their hands on any of acid rains modules raves about them because yeah. not just be partly just hear me out here. The build on them is really nice. Thank you. And to me, that's important. And I think it's important to a lot of people that get into your rack because your rack modules aren't cheap. Mm -hmm. And, um, we want to feel like our stuff is nice. And I feel like every one of these modules, it, it kind of goes to show your industrial design is kind of obvious now. Like you say that mm -hmm. and you look at the stuff that you've been making and it appears like there's somebody with a design background making these modules because they make sense when you look at them. The placement of the encoders, the button choices, um, just the way it's designed in general, it shows kind of some sort of expertise was happening prior to its creation. <laughs> I hope it comes through. It yeah. does. It does. I think it comes through to all of us that buy Thank them. You. Yeah. User interface is a huge focus of Michael and I's in the uh, priorities of developing our modules. Um, we really feel like physical user interfaces are one of the big frontiers in music technology right now. I agree. Um, a lot of people who use Eurorack like work on a computer all day long. Right. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of people coming into it as yeah. a hobby and as a way to make music. Totally. Um, and when you move out of a screen where there's infinite possibilities, right. infinite layered windows, you know, all kinds of pop-up VSTs you can right. use, which are very flexible and, and afford a certain kind of approach to making True. music. Yeah. Uh, and you move into the world of buttons and encoders and LEDs turning on and off. Yeah, yeah. It's a whole different paradigm. And it's really exciting to think about creating interfaces that allow you to do things that maybe wouldn't be so intuitive on a screen, but to do them very quickly and intuitively in a physical object, right. like by pressing different buttons at the same time or yeah. uh, showing you different information that at different times. Um, and of course, you know, like any Eurorack module patching and repatching and, and changing that physically in front of you, right. uh, and trying different things out is, is a whole different kind of way of thinking about it is. sound design yeah. and, and, you know, a, a sequence could just be going, could go anywhere in your rack. It could go right. to a pitch. It could go to a filter opening. It could go to a drum parameter. Um, so yeah, it's just very exciting to be, uh, kind of giving our, adding our voice to this, this amazing sea of ideas in, right. in Euro rack. And that was one of the things that attracted both Michael and I initially to, developing products for this format is that um, we see Eurorack modules themselves as almost little works of art. That totally, are, yeah. You know, because the format, you don't have to worry about like power supply for your, as a product manufacturer. Right, yeah. That's all built into the case. Um, and there's kind of like all these ways that the modules can talk to each other. Right. There's so much room in Eurorack for a diversity of ideas and voices and, right. and approaches and priorities in, in modules that, um, you know, you don't always see in other parts of the music technology yeah. world. It's very true. Yeah. And also I think that Eurorack is kind of, it's not new, right? Yeah. It's not a new thing, but it's very new to everybody now. Like it's a, it's a huge thing right now. It hasn't always been a huge thing. Right. And I think it's going to continue to grow. I, and I personally believe that we're in the beginning 
stage of this this musical revolution with all these people like your company coming around that are using their new ideas and bringing them into the public rather quickly. Yeah, yeah, where you know feel incredibly lucky to be able yeah. to to you know bootstrap this little little company together and get these things actually out into totally. people's hands. You know, it's only been I've only been doing this since maybe you know seriously since late 2018 or that's so that's crazy yeah yeah most companies take years to and release, you do the uh, soldering yourself some of it yeah 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 we do uh a lot of production in house these yeah. days which is pretty fun which is cool yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> learned a lot about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's crazy <laughs> Okay, now run me through. Want all me to your, go through yeah, them? Run me through <laughs> all your modules. Yeah, our current modules. Um, well, our first one was the switchblade. And it's currently discontinued. Um, it was a you know it was a great run. <laughs> and thank you to everyone who bought a switchblade and got our little company off the ground. Um, it's it's challenging to manufacture. It's really the only reason we had to discontinue it for now. But there could be a version two coming at some point. We are, we are thinking about it. Um, but currently available modules, we have our uh, Maestro that we were talking about here, the six-channel clocked modulation controller. We have the Chainsaw, which is a three-voice um, paraphonic super saw, super square oscillator. In stereo. In stereo. Yeah. So it pans the voices left and right so you can how make many voices again seven or, or seven s waves per voice so seven like waves per voice 21 it's a really waves. fat sound yeah yeah and it's a classic sound yeah. you know super saws are super saws are everywhere in music yeah not just trance <laughs> i know that's the that's the uh reputation that this, right. the first thing a lot of music producers think of when they hear the word super saw but they're all over you know pop music from the 2000s till now all over like hip hop right in the yeah. background uh i made a pretty funny playlist a while back of like of super saws super saw <laughs> super saws in in songs oh like that's a good idea soldier boy songs soldier boy and, uh, <laughs> some uh, awesome. some some real uh some real throwback middle school jam that's and, rad yeah and it doesn't have to do super saws yeah it can do super squares uh super squares like a big hollow bass line yeah, you can really use great for bass in mono um and then we have some utility modules, which is the uh, navigator, which is a fader attenuator and a knob attenuverter. And those mix together at the upper right output. So you can uh, use the knob or the fader to create a, like a DC offset and move like a LFO modulation up. Very useful. Yeah, which is really great for um, modules that don't have like trimmers on their inputs. Yeah. You can find that sweet spot does it have a static voltage it does yeah on there's five That's volts awesome. sent into the the attenuverter and the attenuator oh yeah. nice which is great so like like a trick that i like to use and you can do that with a navigator is you run that into a buffered molt or any molt uh, it doesn't have to be buffered, but then you take all those outputs and you send them to a bunch of different modules, mm. and then you have a, one fader that's a big macro control for yeah. adjusting a bunch of things. I like those are the kind of modules that I have to have yeah. in order to have a good live performance. I think. I agree. I think they're uh, they're not as exciting when you first look at them, right. especially when you're getting started out in your totally. It's not like everyone a ignores, super cool oscillator. Yeah, everyone yeah. ignores that kind of stuff. But when it comes to actually using the system, um, we find especially like a f we have pretty long faders on the uh, navigator with a lot of um, you know long throw, so you can really. I find I'm able to dial things in more precisely than on a, a lot of knobs, especially right. like a trimmer knob. Yeah, yeah. You know, that it's really hard to, to find the difference between like 30% and 40% on a trimmer knob um, right. versus yeah. if you just turn that all the way up and then plug a navigator into it, you can really kind of... Yeah, you can. Tease it. And, there's Yeah, there's and, way more fidelity. Yeah. I suppose you put it... And you can perform the fader too. You can you know, move it up, down, down. They're up, more up. exciting. Yeah, exactly. They're just like definitely Kind of like exciting. a, you know, a, a scratch battle DJ. They use yeah. the performance fader going between two decks. You can do... You could totally do that. 
so, the navigator. Yeah, other, with your modular parameters in the navigator. Yeah. And then we just released the junction, which is uh, kind of similar in spirit to the navigator. Um, we see them as kind of twins in mm -hmm. a way, where the navigator is an attenuverter and a long slider attenuator, more for like parameters you're going to change a lot and touch a mm -hmm. lot and move around and then the junction is four attenuverters um so four channels they all have um plus five volts going into the first input and then that's molted down all of the inputs oh that's great um so you can take one voltage and like spread it around and i'm going to demo that in this oh cool uh, yeah demo here and kind of explain what i'm doing um and it uses the smaller trimmer pots. So we see that as something where you're maybe not going to change those parameters quite as often. And That's you just want to dial them in and, and have four channels so you can get a lot out of just a 4HP module. That is the, this is the first time that I've heard from directly from a manufacturer of your rack module, their choice in their trimmer pot like that that actually has to do with what they're hoping you do with the yeah. module, even based on the size of the pot. Yeah, totally. Um, cause those there's, it's all a trade off, right? right? So a fader takes up a lot of space on a module. So you can't use as many of them right. in a small compact utility. Um, whereas the tiny trimmer, uh, little black knobs, uh, take up a lot less space. So you can fit four of them in four HP. So we kind of we want to offer both sides of yeah. the uh, <laughs> of the trade off. That's there. cool. Get a navigators, get a couple of junctions, and then you're set for you know using different ones for different kinds of parameters yeah. based on however your system works. Yeah. Super cool. Um, I think I'm ready to get a demo. See? Yeah.
All right. So I'll tell you a little bit about what I've got going on here in this patch um, and what you just heard. So starting with the maestro over here on the left, we have channel one set to a um, eighth note stepped random. Now that output is being patched to the input of channel two. And when you patch a stepped random into a trigger input like that, what it's gonna do is only trigger channel two when that stepped random output crosses the uh, input threshold to detect a trigger on channel two. So essentially it's creating kind of a rhythmic random set of triggers. And channel two is set to a um, fairly quick 16th note random uh, smooth setting that's controlling the pitch of the Laquelica Teratas here. Laquelica Teratas and Herb Verb are some of my favorite non-acid rain technology modules, and I'm kind of excited to explore them using the Maestro. And so the pitch is being controlled through a navigator. So I'll isolate what that's doing and show you what's going on. You can see that pitch is changing somewhat randomly on the output of channel two. And I'm using the fader as an offset. I can move it way up and I'm using the attenuverter to um, attenuate this voltage coming out of channel two that's controlling the uh, unquantized pitch here. Now channel three is um, going out to a junction here, to the first input of the junction. And I'm, on the junction, the inputs cascade molt. So what that means is the first input, unless you have something patched into the second input, the first input is present on that jack as well, and on the jack below it, and on the jack below that. So it's a multiple, and then I'm taking the three of those outputs that can be individually attenuverted with the three trimmer knobs here into parameters on the Laquelica Teratas. And those I was moving up and down um, at different times to create different timbres, but using the same modulation source. So I'll give you a taste of what that sounds like. Here's none of them. This is modulating the, uh, let's see, one's going into the fold or modulate. Two's going into the morph. So you can see that smooth up-down wave quarter note. And you can move it the other way as well to uh, invert it and modulate down from where the parameter is and back up. And then the uh, third channel here is modulating the pitch of oscillator B in the Laquelica Teratas, creating some crazy harsh FM sounds. These sound very interesting together. Channel four here I have um, doing one of my favorite things, which is to use smooth um, chains or random to modulate the size on the herb verb. And that uh, teleports you through space and time to different size rooms from tiny box to a giant cathedral. And um, I think it's one of the kind of coolest sounding effects in Eurorack. Um, and I'm modulating that with different things based on the different save slots. I think you saw me saving and loading there. So if I load, say, slot two here on channel four, 
have this smooth chain playing. And if I love save slot three, getting some different modulation coming out through this junction here, um, like a uh, square and low chain, which is actually kind of a gate sequence. So we put that in. It's like feeding a gate into the pitch of the uh, second oscillator of La Coelho Cateritas, creating a, a bit of rhythmic um, feel to this otherwise drony, uh, smooth patch. And it's fun to be able to bring that in and out smoothly. Hope that explained what I'm doing here. And I hope you have fun with your maestros at home. Thank you. Thank you.